Welcome to the second afternoon session. Uh, this time, Tobias Brandt will be telling us about breaking down data sets into more bite-sized chunks. Thanks. Good. Good. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my um, talk. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the split apply combined pattern in data science and Python. If you don't know what that is, hopefully by the end of the talk you will. But um, just before we start, can I just get a show of hands? How many people here use Python to process data? Okay, great. <laughs> cool. Okay, so just as a bit of an introduction by myself, um, I was trained as a sort of applied mathematician, physicist, and then I've been in the finance industry since 2005. Um, worked a bit here and then also for a hedge fund in London. So what's known as a, a quant, although I prefer the term data scientist. But uh, um, yeah, so I've worked a lot of, um, with data. Uh, started out with MATLAB, then R, and then eventually I just couldn't take looking at R code anymore and just changed jobs so I could work on Python. So, and yeah, really enjoying the Python data stack. Um, I work for a company called Argon Asset Management. We're a, a black owned and black managed um, investment management firm based in Cape Town. So, we see ourselves very much as a, an African firm with, um, with global standards. And as part of that, we have a very data driven approach to investing. And I think there's a lot of stuff that's sort of just done by, I don't know, sort of like medicine was done. 50 or 100 years ago, and that's changing slowly, um, slowly, and we hope to be kind of at the forefront of that. Okay, so, um, yeah, we're, we're looking at data. So for this talk, I'm going to be using a, um, a data set as a sort of running example, and for that data set, I've picked the GitHub, um, GitHub archive data set, which is... Um, GitHub makes uh, available all their public um, API access uh, calls. And those come in hourly files uh, as um, gzip JSON. Um, so we can see here with um, the sort of yeah, the date time stamp format. Um, I can't remember how much uh, each uh, file is, but um, each file by itself is, is manageable, but um, a monthly data set uh, was more than my laptop kind of could handle. So it was sort of a good sort of um, play size, kind of large, uh, large data set. Just to give you an idea for what it looks like, um, well, let's load in just one line and sort of show you some of the JSON blob. So it's some sort of yeah, standard JSON. I've highlighted in black the fields I'm going to be um, looking at. So there's a timestamp the login of the user that's kind of um, access the API, um, the, the repo, and then the type of event that it is. And under the payload for, for push events, we get um, the number of commits that were pushed up to the, to the repository. So by the way, just um, my, um, the, my whole slides are all in an IPython notebook, and I've just pushed the version that I'm using for this talk to GitHub at 2 p.m. So it's, you can go on, on, on GitHub and have a look at the live code, but all the all the code is in um, in the notebook. It runs as it's shown on the on the screen, and everything is conda or pip installable. So it's kind of like no hidden processing behind the scenes. Okay, so given a data set like that, we have some sort of typical questions that you might want to look at: How many repositories are created in a particular time interval? Um, which repositories get the most commits, um, where you get the most pull requests, which languages are popular on, on GitHub. So I'll just pick two very simple examples to have sort of short code snippets that fit nicely on slides. So the first one is, let's say, how many repositories are created? So one of the event types is a create event. So we can view this very simply in Python. We've, oh, by the way, events uh, is an object uh, list. Um, where is it? Here, I loaded this here with this list comprehension from the file. So it's just parsed um, JSON into um, Python data structures. So it's a list of, of dicts. So I'll be using that in, in memory data structure for the rest of the talk. Okay, so we've got, so we want to count the number of repos created. Set up a, a counter, we go through each event, and every time we look at the event type, every time we hit an, a creation event, we increment a counter by one. 
pretty simple. So we run that, and in this particular file, I'm looking at 3,516 events. Then maybe something that's a little bit more complicated is, well, how many commits are pushed to um, each repository um, over each time interval? So again, we loop through our events. This time we look for push events. Then we extract the repository name, and the payload size is the number of commits. And then we update a, a dict. So we use a dict to keep track of the different repositories in memory, and then obviously depending on which um, repo we got, we increment the correct counter in, in the dict. Again, very simple. Um, so we get counts for all the different um, repos, and then just to keep it manageable, I just print the top five. Um, so you see some of them, they seem to be some sort of mirrors. I don't know who would commit that many commits per, um, <laughs> per hour, but um, maybe people are just using GitHub for backup or, or something. I haven't investigated, interrogated the data too much for sanity. I'm just assuming that kind of everything is fine. Okay, so yeah, so that's possibly like a, a quite a, a sort of standard workflow. And I argue this fits into what's kind of now become known as the split apply combine pattern, which is really kind of a, a take of MapReduce, kind of a maybe a slightly more general form of MapReduce. And I mean, that was uh, introduced, I think the term split apply combine was introduced by Hadley Wickham in a paper in a journal of statistical software in when was it 2011? Obviously, the sort of idea had been around for quite a while, but I think no one had sort of given it a name um, as such. And since then, it's kind of seen, you've seen it sort of cropping up everywhere. So it's got its own um, tag on Stack Overflow. The Pandas documentation has a, uh, a dedicated page. The PyTools package has a dedicated section to split apply combine. The Blaze documentation does. R has a multitude of packages that help you with split apply combine and Julia, the Julia language, which is also kind of quite a, a sort of new uh, hot kind of data processing um, language, um, also has a whole section on, on split apply combine. So it's really kind of pop, um, popping up everywhere and it's kind of one of the basic workflows in processing large data sets. Okay, so what is the, the basic pattern? So as the name says, it's you generally you have a big data set, then you split it by some sort of grouping variable, then you apply some function on each um, on each of the groups independently, and then in the end you combine all the data back into some output data set that you're interested in. One of the key things here is the independence in the middle step, and that's kind of what makes this um, pattern powerful, is because each partition is processed independently, that um, opens it up for sort of embarrassingly parallel parallelization. So you quite, that's kind of why MapReduce and these things work, because once you've got everything split into the groups, you can have as many nodes or um, cores as you want kind of processing each node, because each, no, uh, each group is independent of the other groups. Um, and just in terms of what steps you normally apply, I mean, the sort of simple steps um, are normally like some sort of aggregation or also called a reduction where we take a whole lot of um, records and we get compute one single sort of summary number for, for those records. A transform where the number of records are the same but we just transform them in some way, maybe clean up some parse, some um, strings or something, or filter where we reduce the number of records to a smaller set that we, we're interested in. Okay, so looking at the second pattern, what were we doing here? Well, first thing we were doing is we were filtering by the push events. Then we were wanting to do things by, in the, by each repository kind of independently. So that's really kind of the splitting step, actually. We were using a dictionary to track each um, repository, repository independently. And then finally, we, we did a sum on, on each of the commits for each repository. So kind of... Yeah, so that's kind of um, how this, um, you would interpret um, that sort of piece of code in terms of uh, the pattern. Now, by recognizing the pattern, we can get rid of, of a lot of the, the boilerplate code. So if you saw my two examples that I have, both of them had some sort of um, counter that you initialized outside of the loop. Then you have a loop, then you do stuff inside the loop, and then you sort of look at what you want outside. And by 
recognizing the pattern in different forms, you get to just focus on the, <coughs> the interesting bit in the middle and have a lot of the boilerplate um, code taken care of for you. So my preferred tool for using that is um, Pandas, um, which stands for Python Data Analysis Library. And I'm, how many people here are not familiar with Pandas? Okay, so I'll just say um, a few things. It's, it's, it makes a couple of contributions, but I'd say the main contribution is that it provides the data frame um, data structure. And that's really kind of what came from R, and I think why I used to find myself programming in R, because it's kind of it's a really useful tool um, to have. And data frames, to sort of say very simply, I, I think of them as basic databases in, in memory. If you have a large array, uh, array normally has to be homogeneous data, so it has to be all of the same D type. Whereas a data frame allows each column to be of different um, data types. So you can have a string column, you have a date column, you have some counts, some floats. So it's really like an in-memory representation of databases or spreadsheets even, as we sort of heard in the keynote um, this morning. People still use spreadsheets everywhere. So being able to easily load those into Python um, is very useful. And then yeah, you can do some nice things with uh, labels. So you don't have to refer things by row number. You can kind of label the rows with something that makes sense, like a name or a date or a combination of name and date. So you can easily get to skip to the rows that you're interested in. And Pandas also introduces this hierarchical indexing, which is kind of when you have multiple, a tuple um, indexing each row. And with that, you can actually represent highly dimensional data sets, like a database, if you think about database normalization. So it's really quite um, general what you can do with this. So here's some code that takes all of those events and passes them into a, um, into a data frame. Basically, we just um, data frame has this from records constructor, which just um, expects a sort of a list of tuples. So here I have this make record function, which takes one of the JSON blobs and um, turns it into a tuple, and then I pull that into a data frame. And then when you display it in, in on the screen, you can see that pandas very nicely um, formats the the table for us, and it's even got some magic that in IPython notebooks it formats them as HTML. HTML table, so they kind of look good. So this is great. So this is kind of normal. My, my first step in my data workflow: pull the data into a data frame, and then have a look at the first couple of rows to see what does the data look like. Kind of. um, once we're ready for for working with it, now we've got this so this data structure DF, which is sort of the common um, term for data frame. We've got our instance variable, now we can start working with it. So let's look at our first question, counting the number of create events. So what happens here is we can um, create a filter with this df.type equals create event, and then we can subset the original data set um, with the filter. So the filter produces an array of true-false um, um, values, a vector of true-false values, and then the indexing into the into the table or the data frame just selects the ones where uh, condition evaluated to true. So we can see here that now we've only got the create events left. So now all that remains um, to be done is to find out how many of them are. So we just call length on, on the remaining. Um, yeah. So that's already quite a lot shorter and um, uh, more succinct than the original kind of short Python script, which was short in itself. But um, yeah, you can't beat this for brevity. So let's look at the, the second example. Just a reminder, here's the, the original code. So remember we've got this DF data frame. So again, we apply a filter to filter by push event. Then we call dot group by. Let's say we group by the repo. We pull out the commits column. And then we, we sum the commits. And you can say, lo and behold, we get the same um, we get the same result set as we uh, did before. Now, what's maybe not quite as obvious um, on this on the sc on the screen as when you're actually working interactively is that with the dots you get um, tab completion as you as you're working. So while the code maybe doesn't look that much shorter than the original code, when you're working interactively, you've got your data frame. You say dot, and then you, you, you can tab complete on the column names, and then that fills that in for you, and then you can 
do your next step. So just for interactive work, it's really uh, so much nicer to work with, with pandas. You can do a lot of playing around with your data very quickly and get a good feel for what, what it is that you're looking for. Okay, so I just uh, this one is not important. Just the first um, example I had, we said we could just also group by the type and do the count um, that way, and we get a lot of extra information for free. Um, if you remember the example one, I was just looking at how many create events there are, but with this kind of, it's very simple just to do group by and the sum, so you can actually see how does it stack up to all the other events. Because I think that's well, maybe also one of the things, is when things become that easy, you, you, can, you start answering questions that you maybe weren't um, thinking of before, because it, there's almost zero cost to try, to try and get the solution. Okay, so overall then, I think pandas, it's yeah, great for tab completion. Um, with head and tail, you can look at the beginning of the back of the data set. df.describe gives you summary statistics for your, um, for your different columns. So for example, we'll work out the median and the sort of interquartile range and um, min and max for uh, sort of data columns, so you can see what is the spread of my, my data, so the standard sort of things that a statistician would look for in a, in a data set. So yeah, I use um, pandas all the time, day to day, for my, um, all my interactive work. But there's one caveat, and that is pandas um, currently only handles in, in memory data sets. And that leaves us with a problem when we want to process large data sets. So I'm not going to get um, embroiled in trying to say what is um, define what is big data, but um, as DevOps Borat says here, for me it's kind of anything that doesn't fit into pandas in, in the memory of my PC that I'm working on. So we need to come up with some more um, sophisticated strategies to handle larger data sets. So, um, sorry, just a second. Maybe any questions this far about um, pandas or anything? All good? All following? Yeah. Sorry, can you just repeat that question um, or the comment quickly so that you can get get uh, it on the video? Yeah. Okay. I was just saying that um, with pandas, if you um, if you have memory issues reading in a large file, um, say one of those GitHub files for one month, <laughs> yeah. um, you're you're gonna have to load that into memory, um, the whole uh, data frame, and that could crash your computer. But you can also um, process it uh, using a little. Uh, uh, parameter in the read file um, part where it loops through the um, <coughs> the found chunks mm -hmm. so you can go in like 1000 lines and then next thousand next thousand. but you can set your chunk size and you can just monitor your memory and see if it until you find the sweet spot <laughs> okay no no yeah. great thank you yeah that's um true so that's on like pd.read csv and like yes. some similar yes. things so i'm going to look at some sort of similar strategies um uh, in this that will and then um, another interesting thing I also checked the same guy dead pandas is working on another project called IBIS which I think is a Harida okay. in South Africa okay. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool because he combines um, Hadoop also with pandas but um, using the pandas into um, API or interface so, okay uh, yeah okay great I don't know much about um, IBIS right, thank you okay so when we got um, when we started working with big data then the sort of advice is well you need to get um, Hadoop or Spark, and that means you have to set up a, a cluster, and then probably means you have to hire a DevOps team, and hopefully you get someone that's better than Borat. But I don't know, it's still, there's a lot of over, overhead with the whole process. So I'm just going to try and focus on tools that just allow you to stay in Python and work with large data sets in Python on your PC without having to um, kind of call anyone else in for, for help. And I think actually maybe. So sort of my take on why like Hadoop and MapReduce and these things sort of take took off is because it's it's all centered around MapReduce and that sort of it's forces a constraint on you in terms of what you can do, which is basically list processing. Which um, so people by necessity learn to adapt. But if you just take that insight and say, well, actually we can use list processing, which is iterators in, in Python, and work um, just do that, then we can stay in Python. We don't have to install Hadoop to learn that 
that lesson. We can just actually say, well, let's work with iterators and lists, and as the, um, the commenter uh, pointed out, just process things in chunks, and then we can always stay within the memory of our, pro um, of our PC, but um, work on a big data set, just batch it. So and this was already pointed out in the kind of the structure of an, an interpretation of computer programs, um, the wizard book um, ages ago, and it's kind of maybe being re rediscovered a bit, but um, yeah, Python makes this quite um, easy. So in terms of just our first example, just to call it up again. So in Python in 2, we have reduce and map in the standard library. I believe in Python 3, that might have been moved to the iter tools um, module. But it definitely comes as part of batteries included. And we can redo the same example uh, in this fashion. Just basically what we have is a map that for each event um, filters out if you have a creation event or not, and then followed by a reduction that just sums um, um, uh, uh, keeps the sum as we go along. However, I find that this is kind of just, it's a little bit um, it's nasty to read, that like the logic is inside out, right? The, the data that you want is right at the end, on, on the inside of all the brackets, and then you kind of got to work your way out. Um, so you got to sort of count brackets on the way and find where your data is, and then work your way out. So I've tried to format it here, but in a big kind of code base, it might be hard to see what's actually going on. So what we much prefer to have is um, th something like Unix pipes. And who else here has worked with Unix and the pipe operator? Yeah, so almost everyone. So obviously a very successful model. You have your data, you pipe it to the next process, and you have lots of little tools that do what they do really well. So I've just wrote uh, to highlight this like a little, just a little script here, like three line script that says, well, actually just take the data then you can have a whole lot of transforms, which are functions, and functions are first-class objects in Python, so we can pass them along. And then we can create a data pipe where we just we put in our events at the top, and then we apply each step as we um, as we go along on on the way down. So now we've got a nice flow. We, the data starts at the top, and as you process it, you you move downwards. Um, now. The one thing that's maybe a little bit clumsy is we have these lambdas here, and we have these intermediate variables that aren't that um, kind of nice. So this is a so very common workflow in functional programming languages. So um, some good folks have created the PyTools package, which takes a lot of um, functional sort of language tools and constructs that are available in, in languages like um, Haskell, et cetera, and, and wraps them up with a sort of consistent API. So sometimes it just takes tools out of the iter tools library or func tools library. Sometimes it changes the IP API slightly or makes it a little bit nicer. But um, yeah, whereas I found maybe iter tools not always that easy to work with, this is kind of makes it very nice and, and, and um, handy. So when we import pipe, map, and reduce from the iter tools um, package, we can rewrite the same kind of pipeline workflow like this, where they use what's um, called carrying, um, which is kind of, if you ever used functools.partial, just basically if you, take, if you have a function with two parameters, we can bind one of the parameters and fix that and create a new function that only has one parameter. Um, so with this map, for example, we, we have a, a process step inside, which we then create a sort of a higher level map function, which we want to apply to each element in our events database. So it just saves us a bit of, um, makes it a little bit cleaner that we can just see only the bits that we're interested in and we don't have to have these um, uh, lambda functions hanging around here. It's the same workflow as before, just a little bit more, more readable. So that's um, example one. Um, similarly, we can process example two. And um, yeah, here we use the filter and the reduce by functions. And again, here we, now we have a very nice, clean kind of workflow. It really makes it clear what you know what are the steps that you are applying. You've got a data set, you're filtering it, then you're doing a reduction, and in the end, you're, you're printing it. So yeah, I find this is quite uh, quite neat. You, so you can see, look at your pipeline and see what process is being uh, done. And I think that's really, for me, is the, the point of like learning the split apply, apply um, pattern. Is it distingu yeah, distinguishes what you can do from uh, um, yeah, what you want to do from how you do it. So you can just 
write out the, the filter steps, et cetera, and a lot of the bookkeeping code and all these other things are taken care of for you behind the scenes. So, and I think, I mean, I assume the reason why we all love Python is that it's just, it's very clean and it, it focuses on developer time. And I think that's a similar um, thing here, saying that look, developer time is really expensive, processing time and disk is, uh, is cheap, so let's kind of optimize for developer time. And similarly here, let's make sure that when we look at the code, we, have, we only read relevant code and we don't have to read four loops with um, loop counter variables that are set up outside. So let's get rid of all the bookkeeping code and just look at the logic of the, of the, the problem. So learn the pattern, recognize the pattern, love the, the pattern, and reuse good working code that other people have written. And just you know, maybe a little, little bit more on the same um, point. So you know, iteration is helpful. Yes, we could do the same thing with loops, but the loop doesn't also kind of highlight where a map step is, etc. And it's quite important to see when a map step is, because as I mentioned uh, right at the beginning, is the map often implies independence. So that is a very uh, low-hanging fruit for parallelization. So when you know you've got a map sitting somewhere, then you can quite often like parallelize your, your data pipeline um, trivially without um, doing much work. So that's kind of um, what I'm going to look at here. Um, this, yeah, so here, um, yeah, so then we look at you know, how can we now process the whole month um, in GitHub data set that won't fit in, in, in this um, uh, laptop. And I've just taken the, the same code that we had before, the same um, um, sort of pipeline here, but wrapped it in a little function so that then my um, task scheduler can ship it out to other cores or other um, CPU um, nodes. So we just, yeah, that's the same processing step we did before. And there's 744 um, files here. I'm actually only going to look at 24 because I kept making changes to the talk until the last minute and I made a lot of mistakes and it was taking too long to run. So I kind of just did a, a sh short time frame. But you can just take the uncommented bit out and run it over all files and it will work unchanged. So here we run the same thing on um, um, on one core, just using the built-in map function. And um, yeah, so it takes 22 seconds. And here I've done um, the same thing. And the only thing I've changed is I've st um, started an IPython cluster in, in the background. And I'm using the IPython map sync, which is a, a I'm using the IPython um, map sync function, which is a um, distributed um, map. And the rest of the code <coughs> is, is unchanged. And I um, yeah, immediately get sort of close to four times speed up, kind of just processing in, in parallel. And this kind of used four independent processes running on my PC. But the IPython interface um, is very general. You can have a, a cluster of 10 nodes in your office or on EC2 or wherever and, and take this workflow and immediately start kind of processing large data sets. Okay. Um, then just so um, yeah, one so final section. I won't spend too much time on this. So there's the sort of bleeding edge at the moment. Uh, there's some really exciting new tools coming out, Blaze and um, Dask. I uh, Blaze, I got to work in time for the presentation, so I'll show you that quickly. Dask, I couldn't quite um, get to work just yet, and it's um, very new, but um, looks yeah, very promising. So with Blaze, um, remember here's uh, Blaze borrows a lot of the API from Pandas. So here's our Pandas example. And then here we recreate the same thing with Blaze. Now with Blaze, the idea is that Actually, the pattern is so general that it, it abstracts the computation from actually doing the computation. So we express the computation as an expression tree. And we say, actually, yeah, what I have here is a um, symbol, which is kind of stands for a table or like a record of these data types. And then I want to do this operation. I want to do this filter on push events. Then I use, they have a function by, which is the same as group by in, 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 in pandas. So they will take my push events and group by repo, 
and then take the commits and sum those. And then finally, yeah, just um, sort and give me the top five. Now, all that does is ex expresses a computation, and it builds up a symbolic representation of that computation. It actually does no computation. And then you can tell it to run that computation against a, uh, a back end. So here, I say, well, take a compute, and I take that computation, and I run against my data frame. And then it knows which data pandas API calls to use to run that computation using pandas. And it will run on your um, PC. But um, the same thing is you could use, um, yeah, use a database on, in the background. And um, so here, I, I try to just move the data into a SQLite database. And I'm not sure why I'm showing this, because it didn't work. But <laughs> the examples on the website use Postgres, and um, those all seem to work fine. And I'm sure they'll be working on like kind of uh, Hadoop or PySpark um, uh, backends either. So I think the idea in the future is um, build your expression in, um, in Blaze, test it on pandas locally, and then when you're ready to like run it on a big data set, then you can run it against your um, Spark cluster with resilient distributed data sets and have all the kind of guarantees about kind of um, the res um, resilience and, and there against node failures, et cetera, that you get built in. But um, yeah, you get one, one workflow. Um, yeah, we skip Kastra, sorry, let's go up here. Okay, so bottom line is keep calm, analyze big data in Python. Great, and thank you. Yeah, that's kind of all this. Um, yeah, I'm Synth on, on GitHub. The, the talk is up on GitHub as an IPython notebook. You can view the, the slides on NBViewer. And yeah, if you are interested in the data, um, these data science tools and to pro work on some real problems, we are hiring in, in Cape Town. So come chat to me afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Um, okay, I'll come to you soon. Can you do the equivalent of um, like inner joins and outer joins in these tools and frameworks? Yeah. So um, pandas definitely has um, um, has joins. Um, so merge functions called merge in, in pandas, and can do left joins, right joins, uh, inner joins, outer joins. Um, and they definitely a lot faster than R. Um, I don't know how it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's quite fast. I and mean, most of that code is Cython optimized and it runs pretty, um, um, as, near as, as fast as you can, you can go. So there's no sort of Python overhead there. They've also been doing a lot of um, work in the recent releases on um, releasing the gil for a lot of those operations. So you can also do multiprocessing on, um, um, on multiple cores on your, um, on your PC. Um, PyTools um, is quite careful in documentation to show which some of the operations are kind of um, materialized everything up front, so build a dict or something. So those aren't always kind of that um, efficient. So th they can do joins, and they say if you want to do a large data join, they have a, a sort of a left join that's streaming. So I think the, the left data set has to be fixed, and then you can stream through the right data set. So um, so you can join in something quite quite large. So, but the documentation is quite good, and they 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 tell you what the kind of um, memory kind of needs are for those. Um, and then Blaze, I'm not sure. I haven't worked that much with Blaze yet. Uh, hi, uh, nice talk. Firstly, uh, I recently started working with pandas, and I'd like to know. Uh, does it offer things like uh, re regression analysis and prediction as well? Yeah, so um, it does. So it definitely used to have an ordinary least squares um, method built in uh, for regression, but I think the I haven't followed that much recently. But the stats models package is building on a lot of those things, and the stats models package uses pandas um, as their kind of core API layer. So if it's not in pandas, um, it's it probably will be in, in stats models, and that will use um, Pandas. So there was an OLS function that used to be in pandas. I don't know if it's still there or if maybe they're moving it out and cleaning up the API. It's probably still there. Um, 
Um, okay, so we've got heaps of data in Postgres already. Would you um, rather process it in Pandas, or would there be benefits to processing in Pandas rather than just than using the, the SQL language? Um, can you do more? What specific things would be easier to do in Pandas, uh, that kind of thing? And would, they, uh, would there be an easy way of feeding that data into Pandas and processing it? Okay. Um, yeah, so the first thing I'd say is try and build your expression in Blaze, and then you can run it against Postgres. So if you can keep the data in Postgres, then I think keep it there. There's no real advantage to pull it into Pandas for operation that you can run in Postgres. Um, I think the one, I don't know, I don't, I'm not that familiar with, uh, with Postgres. Something I've in the past working with Microsoft SQL Server was always that because SQL is kind of, you have no, um, there's no dependence between the rows. Every row is independent, right? So like things like window functions, I know those SQL has improved, those might be in there now, but sometimes if you want, on a subgroup, you want to sort it and find the first record or something like that, um, that's often a lot simpler in, in, in Pandas. Or if you, you, know, you want to do some, something incremental, like a cumulative sum, for example, that might be hard in, in Postgres, I'm, I'm not sure. But um, those things, and yeah, the, so Dask, um, Dask is look is really um, no, I'm very excited about Dask once I see it work it properly. But they, um, yeah, they it's all about chunking. So they use pandas to work on each little bit, but they also work out an expression graph and they've put a lot of work into analyzing, um, you know, what data to keep in the cache to keep sort of hot and what to flush out and how to shuffle. Um, things around. So that will, once you can express your computation in Blaze and Dask, you can, it will pull in what it needs from Postgres um, in chunks, um, as the previous person mentioned, and then work on it um, that way. But um, yeah, I think only where needed for, like the simple things I showed, I'm sure you can do all that in Postgres. It's only when, normally kind of I found where SQL falls short is if you have serial dependence. So if you're trying to do like a simulation or something where the next step depends on the previous step, in which case you can't parallelize. And yeah. Any other questions? Just one question related to that. With SQL, we always have a problem where if you have like a parent-child relationship, it's difficult to actually move up the, without doing some store procedures. It's difficult to move up the chain. So if you have a table with two columns and one is the parent of the other, mm -hmm. trying to go up that is quite a difficult task. Does this perhaps help in that kind of thing? No, I, I don't know. Not offhand. I think if it's very deeply nested, you always you're probably going to have to. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, either you self-join like 50 yeah, times, then yeah. you have a huge table, <laughs> or you have to kind of process one step at a time. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Sorry, that, that kind of data structure where you have basically a, a relational database, a table which has a self-referential parent relationship to itself. A long time ago, and the, you can probably still find it on the internet, there was a great article on, of all places, the MySQL database website about how to convert from that to using a, essentially a, a balanced tree model where you, it's, it's a bit difficult to explain, but it becomes slower to write that data but since generally you're more often reading data than writing it, the, re the reading becomes a hell of a lot faster. And you can convert your data from the one structure to the other, so, yeah. There's one other thing, I mean, I'm not sure what your use case is exactly, but just for interactive work, I mean, SQL Alchemy is great for those sort of things. So I found with those sort of tables, once you've got sort of SQL Alchemy expressions, you can also use dot and then kind of go hunt down the tree but that's not going to help you process batch process things. Um, yeah. More questions? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Tobias. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's just one.